The thriller genre of literature is enormous in scope, covering everything from cozy Agatha Christie style murder mysteries to gritty police crime dramas that dads like to take on holiday. And it also overlaps with things like the gothic and horror, and like horror, thrillers can be very introspective to the point of being kind of metafictional. Think the Scream movie franchise. Death of a Bookseller is kind of like that. It's a very curious, exciting, and fresh new thing. This is a novel that is almost metatextual, almost tongue-in-cheek in the ways that it explores the thriller genre as a thriller itself, but I wouldn't actually call it metatextual. It's a very serious thriller, and something very, very unique within the genre, unlike anything I've ever read. I've read metatextual thrillers, I've read horror novels that play on the tropes of horror, but in fresh ways, and I guess that's kind of what this is. This is a book that understands its genre, full of characters that are very aware of how thrillers work, but it doesn't quite move into scream levels of self-awareness and metatextuality in my opinion. What this is, is a book that very much understands the current zeitgeist when it comes to our obsession with true crime, and it has a go at saying something really unique about that, while still being a very engaging and fun thriller. In fact, this book is about 350 pages long, and I read it in a day. I don't think I've ever done that. When I really, really love a novel, I might read 200 pages in a single day. 350? That's absurd. But I did it anyway. I could not stop reading this. It is the most Moorish novel I've ever read. So what's it about? Death of a Bookseller is Alice Slater's debut novel. It's set in 2019 in East London, in a bookshop that is a stand-in for Waterstones. In Walthamstow, East London, there's a branch of a chain of bookshops called Spines, and this branch is really poorly located. It's not really getting enough traffic through it to remain in business, it's always sort of on the cusp of shutting down, and our protagonists are the people that work in this bookshop. We have two point-of-view characters. One is a girl called Roach. Roach is her last name, but it's what everyone calls her. And she's been working at this bookshop for a while. She's kind of in her early 20s, and working at this bookshop is all she's ever known. And then there's Laura. Laura's also a veteran bookseller, but she's just been moved over to this branch. Very cleverly, the first thing I want to mention is the fact that both of these protagonist narratives are written in the first person, but Roach's is written in the past tense, while Laura's is written in the present tense. And this has a few different effects that I'll go over in a second. Roach is a character that I can, I guess, unfortunately, sympathize with. She's an edgy young woman, she's a metalhead, she loves death and the gothic and horror and all things related to crime and murder. She's one of those people absolutely obsessed with true crime podcasts. She listens to a lot of them, and she knows everything about serial killers, the really famous ones and the more obscure ones, and she's really proud of that, and she thinks it makes her very unique and edgy. Laura is almost a stereotypical modern-day bookworm, and from Roach's perspective we see a very cynical description of Laura. She carries a tote bag everywhere, she kind of looks cottagecore cosy, and these days I see myself as a blend of these two characters. I carry a tote bag everywhere in the winter, I dress very cottagecore, and the rest of the time I dress more goth punk. So I kind of really sympathise with both of these characters. But what's interesting about them is that Laura has a very traumatic past. Something really awful happened to her as a teenager. She lost her mum, and we learn more about how she lost her mum and those circumstances as the novel goes, and it's really, really important. But Roach, who is, again, obsessed with death and the gothic and all things creepy, sees a kindred spirit in Laura. Roach is a really, really quiet, introverted person who doesn't really get along with her colleagues, she doesn't really socialise with them in any typical way, she goes around calling everyone who isn't her a normie. And I've actually got friends who still use that phrase. Everyone else to her is a normie. She's unique. She's interesting. She's non-conforming. 
And despite the fact that Laura looks very normy, Roach is sure that there's something dark inside of her that she becomes really obsessed with. And it kind of reveals itself when we find out pretty early on that Laura writes and reads her own poetry. When Roach hears some of her poetry at a reading, she goes, oh yeah, holy shit, this girl is dark. There's some darkness in her. And this book is all about Roach's obsession with Laura. Roach is a person for whom obsession is her personality. She obsesses over true crime, she obsesses over, well, Laura. Those are kind of the two main things. She obsesses over true crime podcasts, books, Netflix documentaries, and now Laura is her new topic of obsession. A little bit later in the novel, Roach also gets a boyfriend, a guy called Sam, who is disgusting. And Alice Slater writes him so, so well this really nasty, greasy loser guy. I was amazed with how well Slater writes his character and their interactions with each other, both on an emotional and conversational level and on a physical, social level. It's revolting in a really compelling way. What makes the dynamic between Roach and Laura so interesting is that Laura hates the concept of true crime. As a very proud feminist, Laura says that true crime is gratuitous. So much true crime stuff is created by men to romanticize male serial killers of women, men who do terrible, terrible things to women and then become deified. And it's not just men who do this. A lot of the obsessive fans of serial killers and the people who host true crime podcasts and write books about these people are women. There is something very alluring about these people. And we've talked about this for decades. This is a thing that so many people know and see the problems with. I myself recently got into a true crime podcast, which is something I swore I'd never do. I started listening to Morbid. I love it. I listen to it every day when I go for a run. It's a weird thing to run to, but I mean, I'm not a normie, so. <laughs> Morbid actually helped me with this as well because Roach talks a lot about specific serial killers and I recognize them. One more obscure one that I'd never heard of was Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. I just learned all about him on Morbid and he's referenced a lot in this book when Roach says that her boyfriend Sam kind of looks like a white Richard Ramirez. So knowing a little bit about true crime and serial killers does help you empathize with both of these characters with Laura's hatred of true crime and the zeitgeist and the concept because of how abusive it is towards women and the fact that these women are victims who get forgotten and the men who kill them become deified. And then you also sympathize with Roach who obsesses over this stuff. And so many of us do. So many of us watch true crime documentaries on Netflix and listen to the podcasts. And I, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know how I managed to get into this stuff. And Alice Slater, has a point when it comes to both of these characters. Roach is a very relatable character. She's sad and you do kind of sympathize with how pathetic she is. And you really, really empathize with Laura, despite the fact that she is a rich girl, her daddy pays for her flat, but her feminist argument against true crime is very, very valid and understandable. Both of these characters are flawed and strange and difficult to love, but also easy to empathize with as well because they're human. But the thriller aspect of this book is the fact that Roach unhealthily obsesses over Laura to the point that Roach becomes very dangerous. And it's that obsession and the way that it grows really slowly and gradually throughout the novel that compels you to keep turning the page. And it's the reason I read this book within 24 hours. I couldn't stop turning the page to find out how deep and dark this rabbit hole would go when it comes to Roach's obsession with Laura, what actions she would do, how far she would go. There's also a brilliant bit early on, a tiny paragraph, where Roach just mentions to the reader that a few years from now, she will be in New Orleans on vacation, there to watch a podcast live hosted by people who live in New Orleans. And she will think back to Laura and remember Laura and talk about how even after Laura's death, her ghost is still haunting Roach. So we know that the title of the book, Death of a Bookseller, is about Laura. Laura must die in this book. That's to be expected. Roach is obsessed. Laura must die. Does Roach kill her? Is Laura killed by someone else? Early in the book, from Laura's perspective, we find out that someone is leaving a mark in and around her house. She finds footprints 
in the flower pots outside of her window. Someone is trying to get in, or maybe succeeded. We don't know. Laura is being stalked, and she has a history with murder that we find out more about later on. And back to the thing about how Laura is written in the present tense and Roach in the past, this very, very smartly and subtly implies that Laura doesn't have a future. Her narrative must be written in the present tense because at any point it could be snuffed out. It's like, as you read it, you're thinking, this could just be cut. It's all in the present tense until it's not anymore. But the fact that Roach's story is written in the past tense means that she is telling us this story from the future, a future that she has. Roach is safe, Roach will be okay. The death cannot be her. There can't be a twist where Roach is the one that dies. Roach has a future and she's telling us this story from that future, but Laura doesn't. So all the while we're expecting Laura to die and we don't know when. I wondered if she would die halfway through and the rest of the book would be from Roach's perspective. You wonder a lot of things as you go. This is a book about death, about murder, about true crime, while you wait for a crime to happen and other smaller crimes happen in the meantime. I was so wrapped up in this, in this narrative. I hate the fact that I sympathize with and can relate to Roach as a character and also with Laura as well. These are two people who are very much in the world of literature. They're two booksellers who both read a lot, but read very differently. Laura is arrogant and snobbish, but again, her feminist attitude is one that is very relatable, very sensible, you can't deny it, but it makes her unlikable because of how aggressive she is about it and how much she despises Roach while Roach obsesses over her. And Roach is someone that I felt sorry for a lot of the time, and as someone who also enjoys dark, goth, punk things, I relate to her in at least an aesthetic sense, but I didn't want to relate to her because she's the fucking creepy one. <laughs> she's also arrogant and thinks that she's above everyone else who's a normie. There's so much to love about these people, they're very indicative of today, of young women today from different worlds, even though they exist in the same world. They're both young white women who were born and raised in London. They have a lot in common. They're from the same side of the tracks, and yet they've decided personality-wise to be very different, and the connection between them, Roach's obsession with Laura, it is just so engaging. This is a book that doesn't quite go into the metatextual realms of being a thriller about thrillers, but it's certainly a thriller that understands itself and wants to talk about the genre while being a really engaging, dramatic, and captivating thriller in and of itself. I adored this book, what an amazing debut novel. Please check out Death of a Bookseller. What a fantastic novel. Check out Death of a Bookseller and subscribe for books.